All right. Uh, so we had three breakout questions on the table. Uh, the first of which, who was Carter G. Woodson? Um, who would like to share what they talked about in their discussion in regarding who Carter G. Woodson was? Um, I'll go. Okay. Um, well, I also, um, Anthony um, pointed out that he was the founder of History Week, and then he was an author, and he mostly like published um, his work on Garvey's newspaper. Um, he was an activist and he usually just commented like on like black individuals like lives during that time. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Who was Marcus Garvey? So Marcus Garvin was a pretty much an activist and a, uh, I would say, almost like a revolutionary where he wanted to separate the Black people and give them a chance and get away from, you know, he wanted to get back to his homeland, his country and their teaching, rather than adopting the uh, ways of America. And who would like to share their contemporary analysis? So how does the reading how does the work of Marcus Garvey, how does the work of Carter G. Woodson uh, relate to what's going on in our world today? So, uh, you know, political wise, and people have different ideas. So I'll go with the, like, you have democratic, the word democratic mean democracy, and so you have so many people believe in unite the people has a voice and you have people that don't believe that they believe government should be run. And so we still have that same thing they had in the past, people with different ideas and direction to get to somewhere. And it's always a conflict and there's never like, we have a society where voting, who wins the most vote wins, and have to say so. So back then they didn't have that. Of course, blacks or what they call them, uh, trying to get equalism or trying to get recognized in Finnish society, but there was many whites or Europeans that didn't want them to be Finnish society. So it was kind of like they was forcing their way into some that didn't exist. They was trying to make a, a pattern, cookie cutter. Anyone else, uh, contemporary analysis, how does the work of Du Bois, how, sorry, work of Woodson or the work of Garvey uh, relate to what's going on in your world today? Let me ask you this. What was celebrated last month? Black History Month. And I would say um, that like, even though like, yes, we have Black History Month to celebrate, you know, African-American achievements and accomplishments in history, I would say like, um, even then, like, it's still not as, not as like appreciated. I would say like, sometimes it could be even with Blacks ourselves. And even then, like, Sometimes um, our holiday could turn into something political, like something for a political gain. Okay. Thank you, August. That's, that's a um, actually a, re a really good segue. Um, we do know that Carter G. Woodson created Black History Month, correct? Like, okay. So let's pick up where August left left us off, right? That 
so-called holiday, that holiday is not appreciated or not celebrated. And my knee-jerk reaction was, well, it's because they don't understand. And, 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 and what I want to be, be clear, right? Ox is saying even Black folks themselves, right, don't fully appreciate what that is. And again, my knee-jerk reaction was because they don't understand history. Because if you understood the history of what Black History Week was and what it was intended for, there would be no one, and I would say Black or otherwise, but especially Black, who would really not value or appreciate it. Because one of the things that Carter G. Woodson sought to do with Black History Week and then turning it into Black History Month was to kind of rewrite history. So think about the reading we had a couple of weeks ago where they talk about the stereotypes and the myths that have been created about African people and how those stereotypes and myths create a history about a particular people. Not to get too philosophical, but there's a uh, Martin Martinican philosopher, um, psychiatrist by the name of Franz Fanon, and he develops what's called the racial historical schema. The racial historical schema. And what the racial historical schema is, is the capacity to judge someone by the history of their race historical racial schema, the capacity to judge someone by the history of their race. Now, based off of the stereotypes and the myths that we've learned that have been created about African people, you can understand the treatment that are being deployed to them. And so what Fanon sought to do was to understand that from a psychoanalytical perspective. But what Carter G. Woodson sought to do was attack history. So if the history is what's developing the racial historical schema, hence historical, right? Let's meet that at the head. So what we'll do is we'll celebrate all the historic feats of African people in one week's time frame. And during that week, there was magnificent plays, magnificent poems, magnificent celebrations put on by various African students, by various African professors, by various African teachers to celebrate the history of what African people were. There was a school in particular called M Street School um, in Washington, D.C., where um, not only did Carter G. Woodson teach, but also... Um, Anna Julia Cooper, who, who was one of the really um, famous pedagogues or, or instructors of that time. Now, M Street School had a capacity to pump out really brilliant intellectuals. And M Street School, again, under the tutelage of uh, Carter G. Woodson, as well as An um, Anna Julia Cooper, allowed the students of M Street School to have a real clear understanding of what their history was. Carter G. Woodson, in fact, is the second African uh, African descended individual to graduate from Harvard because of his connections through the M Street School. But again, this notion of rewriting history, or what you may call a counter narrative, is important because it shifts the way that African people look at themselves in the way that the world looked at African people. Now, not to um, produce a comparative, but in his own right, Marcus Garvey was just a bad motherfucker. Like he just moved in a way, in a in a um, unashamed and, and non-compromising way that shifted a lot of the way that African people sought to move through space. Marcus Garvey believed that it's a question of land. How we resolve the race issues is through a question of land. Mm -hmm. Our land is in Africa. The resources of Africa should be controlled by African people. 
Marcus Garvey is what you call a Pan-Africanist. In fact, the red, the black, and the green comes from the mind of Marcus Garvey. The red is for the blood that was spilled. The black is for the people themselves. And the green is for the land and the resources, which is Africa. Africa for the Africans at home, those living in with Africa, and abroad, those outside of Africa. Africa for the Africans at home and abroad. So what Marcus Garvey sought to do was to build up a nation for all African people within Africa. And while in Harlem in the 1920s, he was able to build the largest ever mass movement of African people within America, still to this day. The brilliance of Marcus Garvey was able to amass and produce what's called the Black Star Line. The Black Star Line transported goods, resources, and information back and forth to Africa. Not to mention African people, right? A reverse migration across the Atlantic. Marcus Garvey's um, movement was funded by African people. He was the foremost believers in this notion of self-determination and self-sufficiency. We don't need anyone else to do it for us. We could do it ourselves. And how he amassed his movement financially was by donations from African people within America. So you could call them a poor people, but at the time, the way they were able to organize their funds and pull their funds together, allow them to establish a shipping company that transported goods, services, and migrations across the Atlantic. So you can see what a so-called poor people can do when they're organized and focused. So a little background about Garvey, a little bit background about Carter G. Woodson. Um, I think the chapter starts off with a very cold quote from, Wood, from Woodson. He says, Negroes here and there in America have been hailed as leaders. The press has given them great praise and their friends have sung their virtues in high tones. But a thorough analysis of these famous Negro leaders will disclose the fact that they owe their prominence mainly to white men who consider such spokesmen as those persons through whom they could work to keep the Negro in his place. So in other words, the black, so-called black leaders who are celebrated in this country, right? They are celebrated because they have been propped up in a position by the very same people who seek to keep African people down. They're put in these positions to maintain the status quo for African people. Does that make sense? So let's let's think through that. Name for me some black leaders. Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, um, George Watt, um, Af oh, African leaders. Like of our time now. Oh, Who are the black leaders of today? Barack Obama. Okay. That's the best you come up with? Because, I mean, that's a that's an easy one, right? Like, we, he's the, he was the fucking president. Like, <laughs> you know what he was intended to do, right? Like, <laughs> well, we, we're going to say, <laughs> oh, Lloyd Austin. Uh, Lloyd Austin. I don't even know who Lloyd Austin is. Uh, uh, inform me, please. The second, um, the Secretary of um, Defense of the United States of America. Okay. The Secretary of Defense of the United States of America. So he defends us, right? So he's the one who provides like artillery and weaponry to Israel. <laughs> so this is who you're saying is, is a black leader? Let's try again. Someone else, please. God damn. We got Obama, the president. Well, and the second we got guy. Johnson. I'm sorry. Got Johnson, the, Johnson, the writer and the originator of Ebony. Okay. Magazines. We're doing better. So I heard another um, name. Alicia Garza. Alicia Garza. Um, that's the, the senator. 
No, she was a founder of Black Lives oh, Black Matter. Black Lives Matter. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um. Yes, we're getting better. Okay. Anyone else? What's What's good? What I do appreciate about your responses. What I truly appreciate. No one said a fucking celebrity. So I, I thank God to that because nine times out of 10, when I ask this question, everyone throws out these celebrity names and it's like, oh my God. But at, at least y'all didn't go that way, right? And, and at least you had the capacity to, to provide me some names that actually have moved the needle forward for Black people, right? So I think what that speaks to is your level of intelligence and, the, and your ability to assess a leader and, and what the leader is intended for. Because again, nine times out of 10, who always comes up, Jay-Z. And I'm like, really, Jay-Z? Then I'll get Oprah. And I'm like, oh my God, really, Oprah? But especially Jay-Z, because I think he's a little more cunning in the way that he goes about his leadership. I want y'all to kind of like, I know you're, 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 you're a little younger than, you're a lot younger than me, but I want you to think back a little bit when you were, Let's say uh, Colin Kaepernick, right? Y'all know why Colin Kaepernick is relevant, right? Why did Colin Kaepernick decide to take a knee? Nope. Because we were, they wanted them to honor the flag that was the same thing that was oppressing them. Right, but let, let, what was the specific thing that was happening that caused him to not honor the flag? Because of like racial injustice and police brutality that was going on. Perfect. Thank you. Racial injustice, police brutality, the police killing black folks, right? So this is why he took his knee. That this is the purpose for his knee. Okay. Because of this, the numbers of NFL viewership plummeted. Right? People stopped watching the game. Right. So if you know anything about the NFL, they about they back, right? So who do they partner with to resolve the issue? Hove himself. Now, you go on YouTube if you don't believe me, but there's an interview with him, Roger Godell, and the um the the like owners and the CEOs of like Rock Nation and, and the major business parts within that conglomerate, in which he says, kneeling is over. We gotten past that. Now again, I ask you why. Why did he kneel in the first place? Because black folks was getting killed by the police. Now, that's still going on today. Am I wrong? Okay. So are we past kneeling? Fuck no. But what we did get is some dope-ass halftime shows, right? Usher, Beyonce, I, um, like, you know, Dr. Dre and him, right? But what it does, it keeps the Negro in his place. Because what the work of Colin Kaepernick was doing was trying to move the social position forward. But in one fell swoop, these so-called leaders are able to push us back because we're beyond kneeling, right? So this is the, 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 the astute level of analysis by Carter G. Woodson, right? This is how he's able to assess leadership and what leadership is supposed to be like. Woodson was also, among other things, a contemporary of Marcus Garvey. The Journal of Negro History founded by Woodson first appeared in 1916, the year of Garvey's arrival in the United States. The celebration of Black History Week, pioneered by Woodson, was begun in 1926, the year before Garvey's deportation to Jamaica. And just as Woodson, the historian, also indulged in political activist um, causes, so too Garvey, leader of the largest mass movement in Afro-America, was also keenly interested in Black history. It stands to reason the paths of these two giants of the 1920s should have crossed. Garvey's publications commented regularly on Woodson and his work. The two men had mutual friends and acquaintances. Woodson's political activity brought him perilously close to being drawn into the Marcus Garvey Must Go campaign aimed at Garvey's imprisonment and deportation. So what we hear, have here is, is they're talking to the fact that these two men operated at the same time, right? 
They were contemporaries. They both, both existed in the 1920s. They both had the same interest, right? They both were in history. They both were into history. They both were activists, right? But they never crossed paths. They had the same homeboys, right? But them, them they themselves, they never were quite worked together directly, right? Or, or across paths. But you also have, excuse me, what you also have is this notion that Woodson was pulled into this conversation around trying to get rid of Marcus Garvey. One of the things about Marcus Garvey, he was very staunch again about this notion of self-determination. He was very staunch and, and serious about having pride in who you are as a people in the term as it pertains to, you know, how you look your features, your skin color, things of this nature, right? Um, some of these tactics of Marcus Garvey did not always sit well with certain individuals. And because of his activist efforts, um, there was a vast movement to try to get rid of um, Marcus Garvey. And what the author is arguing is that Carter G. Woodson almost got swept up into that movement. But he was able to avoid that by being a contributor to Marcus Garvey's um, paper, which is the Negro World. On a note in regards to Marcus Garvey, I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Don't want to say something. Yeah, I was going to say that uh, just to piggyback on what you said about Marcus Garvey wanted all black people to have their own stuff, and they felt that Africa was a bigger or more richer or more greener or more everything than America was. And so he also was an educator to people who didn't read or write or, and there was a lot of blacks that didn't do that or learn that, but they was workers. And so uh, when they talk about the White House, they say, well, who built the White House? The slaves, the blacks, who built, New York, who built the stock exchange. And so, yes, uh, but the black people was the center point of money, economics. And so some people, even though Marcus Garvin knew this, he said, look, let's take this and go over to our land and we could do whatever we want to do over there. However, we had people, other black people that said, getting back to his point, that some black says, look, we built this land, we made this land, I'm not going anywhere. And so that is a continuation of contemporary things now versus back then that right now it don't have an end. Good point. Um, and also what I was gonna say about Garvey, um, anybody familiar with the CIA program Cointelpro? <laughs> so I'll, I'll give you just a brief run down, but I, I would ask you to go look this up. COINTELPRO is a counterintelligence program that the CIA used to spy on and destroy all major progressive Black movements. COINTELPRO's first victim was Marcus Garvey. And when I say its first victim, I mean from Marcus Garvey, to Fred Hampton of the Black Panther Party, to um, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, right? When I say every major Black leader was destroyed by COINTELPRO, every major Black leader. At the head of COINTELPRO was J. Edgar Hoover. In my estimation, the most diabolical motherfucker ever to walk this planet. Every single black movement was destroyed by this organized this um, this central intelligence agency and the works of J. Edgar Hoover. Some of the tactics that they would employ. So um, in the early '60s, there was the Black Panther Party in Los Angeles, and there was the US Movement, United Slaves, is what they called themselves. Um, these two organizations were built directly from rival gangs. And what happened is the Black Panthers come in and they kind of make these gangs political, right? They turn them into Panthers. The rival gangs were turned into us organization members. So what the CIA would do is things like send letters to the Black Panther Party from the us organization saying that they would kill them. 
they would send letters to the US organization from the Black Panther Party saying that they would kill them, right? So these things would stoke tensions within these two organizations. They would know that there were like rivalries or beasts within the organizations because they would spy on them. They would send people who work for the CIA to join these so-called organizations to gather information, right? So if you're familiar with the campus of UCLA, they have what's called Bunchy Hall. Bunchy Hall is the hall is the name of a Black Panther member who was murdered on the campus of UCL of UCLA by a, or, a US organization member due to this counterintelligence information that was provided by the CIA, right? So these, this is this is one example, one small example of how this agency and the tactics that they used to destroy these movements. Same with Marcus Garvey. They got him up on a fraudulent um, tax charge about a mail fraud or something of that nature, very small. But again, this is something that was planted by J. Edgar Hoover in the CIA. There's a movie called Judas and the Black Messiah that came out not too long ago. It's literally about this counterintelligence and how it works. Um, so that's an, uh, another point of reference. Um, this is, I think is important. And I'm looking on the page, bottom of page 102. Um, it talks about some uh, money that Carter G. Woodson received. It says a spat of such commentary took place in 1922 when Woodson accepted a grant of $50,000 from the Carnegie and Rockefeller Foundation. Robert Lincoln Poston, sometime UNI a Secretary General, um, implored Woodson though to be careful for nothing could have more harmful effects on the Negro than a, his, than a Negro history dictated by white capitalists. William Ferris expressed the same concern <laughs> and a Negro world editor com commended Woodson on the gift while harboring the same reservations. The reservations expressed over this gift were rooted in the doctrine of black self-reliance one of the ideological rocks upon which the UNIA was built. It was consistent with the position when in 1927, Negro world columnist S.A. Haynes rushed to the support of Woodson in his effort to independently raise $20,000 for the, pop, the, for the uh, preparation of Negro history. So what's happening here, right? You, the, this name Rockefeller should sound familiar to you. The name Carnegie should sound familiar too, right? Um, not like Jay-Z Rockefeller, but like where he got that name from Rockefeller, right? Like the original family, the Rockefellers. So they made a donation of $50,000 to Woodson's foundation. Now, the um, secretary general of Marcus Garvey's organization cautioned Woodson like, yo, be easy with that money. Right, because once they provide you that money, then they're going to dictate the terms and how you're going to be able to report our history. Nothing could be more detrimental to Negro history than a Negro history funded by white capitalists. That's the warning that they gave Woodson. Right. And so not only did they warn him against taking this money, because, again, who controls the money is going to control how you make your moves in your organization. They supported him. Right. When he was trying to raise money for his independent organization, they threw up some bread. And they're saying that this ideology, the way of them being able to caution Woodson, stems from how Marcus Garvey instilled self-reliance in them. You don't need anyone else but yourself. Whatever you think they could do for you, you could do for yourself and have the capacity to do it on your own terms. So you could see why Marcus Garvey was posed as a threat. Because is it not true that if he would have took that, or he did take that money, and it is true that he was controlled and manipulated in the way that he was able to tell history. And he still did what he was supposed to do. But as history shows, he never took their money again. 
So there's a lesson to be learned in the teachings of not only Marcus Garvey, but the life of Woodson in the sense of being able to course correct, right? All right, bet I'm gonna take your bread. Mm, I see how this played out. Nah, I ain't fucking with y'all no more. I'm gonna ante up my own money. Um. Also within this time, right? Well, I don't really want to get into that. Um, <laughs> I was gonna get into the whole the boys Woodson um debate, but I don't really want to do that. Um, that's, that's least interesting to me. Shit, what we'll do, we'll put a pause on that. We'll transition into fish bowling. Um, again, let's talk about what was discussed in the breakout groups. You can talk about your journals, or you can talk about what was discussed in the lecture. Um, does anyone want to volunteer? Uh, if not, I'll um, call at random. And if you went already, you know, just let me know. I'm trying to look. That's what I'm looking at now. But just let me know if you went already. Um, you do have to go twice per semester. Um, uh, Kate, are you prepared to fishbowl? I did my tool already. Well, thank you, Kate. Mm -hmm. uh, Andrew, are you prepared to fishbowl? Yeah, I can go. Thank you. I did it once, so I just didn't do okay, it. Let's a second. Thank you. Um, Brian, are you prepared to fishbowl? Uh, okay. And Jocelyn, are you prepared to fishbowl? So we'll yeah. go. Thank you. We'll go in that order. Um, Andrew, Brian, Jocelyn. I'm just going to read what I, I wrote in my uh, journal. Uh, the thesis for this reading would be about the life of the Black historians Marcus Garvey, who was a Jamaican activist interested in Black history, and Carter G. Woodson, an author, and how they created an outlet for Black history for its own section and genre and study of the Negro life. My analysis of the reading is it talks about how these men were able to bridge the gap between Black history and American history as a way to connect them both. Even though the historians had different views, some they had common interest in Black history and uplifting it. Overall, my contemporary analysis is how it relates today is uh, now we have um, Black History Month, which is, um, is I feel, uh, a, um, an effect of what they were trying to do. Uh, from what uh, they created, uh, since Black History uh, Week was created, they're trying to um, encourage Black History Month as well. And, yeah. Thank you, Brian. I'm sorry. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Brian, you're up next. Uh, I just wanted to talk about how my interest that both of these um, historians live at the same time, but never cross path. Uh, something surprised me. Uh, both of them were impactful at the time, and therefore their um their works actually affected later on the years as having black his like for example Black History Month is something that lives on from their works and you know um and also that um the main goal was to help. Um, um, find like, um, I'm sorry, but help. Um, the reason was that they, um, helped, um, create this, um, gap for Black historians at the time and therefore now have more, um, to basically engage, um, in their thoughts and often to publish to the public. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Jocelyn? So I want to talk about how you were talking. Um, what was interesting to me, what you were talking about the well, the last time you said, how they were um, how they were trying to give them the fifty thousand. Um, I think that I think that very interests me. I didn't really 
know about the Yubin IA. Um, I thought it was interesting how you said how if they give them the money that they were able to choose what they wanted with that. Well, with that information, um, I think that was interesting. And I think how that I think that connects with now how um blacks are still um targeted and so in crimes that they don't do. And I think that kind of compares. I think that's all I want to say. Thank you, Jocelyn. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things I thought about in the sense of who gives you the money controls what you want to do. And, and to, I'm thinking of a way to like make that make more sense for you all. Um, have y'all heard of the term lobbying? It's a political term. Have you heard of the term lobbying? So Jasmine, what's lobbying? You're on mute. Is it where like funds are raised for like an organization? Kind of. Or something like that. Yeah, that, funds are very key. That's very key. Uh, Anthony, uh, what, what what's lobbying? Like when the they give funds to a certain government organization to uh, pass certain policies and um, in, interests of the person who gave the money. So you're right, Jasmine, but it's, it's directed to government officials, right? And, and that money is used to produce policy, okay? When I was doing my undergrad at Cal State LA, I was a, um, what's it called? Like a, a volunteer for the CFA, um, the California Faculty Association. And um, what we had the opportunity to do was to go up to the state capitol and lobby around, um, I forget, uh, like we we're trying to uh, um, stop the, fee increases or something to that degree. I can't remember exactly what it was, uh, but what I do remember, uh, spent the whole day knocking on doors, trying to get signatures and shit like that, going through your little spill. And like, I think it was the last or the second to the last person that we spoke to just kept it like a hundred with us. It was like, you know, this is a really good pitch, you know, and I'll sign it, but you know what you're missing. A manila envelope. I'm like, oh shit, she's talking about some money. She said, yeah, this is how these policies get passed. Y'all doing everything right, but you don't have the financial capital to make anyone change their mind about how they'll go about producing this policy. So think about this. If these are government officials who are telling like students and faculty members of a university that we can't help your cause because you don't have any money. Who do you think controls how policies and things get ran through in the country? Motherfuckers with the money, corporations. So this is an example of, of what Woodson and Garvey are talking about in the sense of being weary of who you take your money from. Another place where this is kind of tricky is like nonprofit organizations. You may have a very philanthropic and a very progressive and a very, dare I say, revolutionary platform and thought process. But if you take money from people who aren't about that, how long do you think that's going to go? <laughs> Yeah, because also like many of these uh, nonprofit organizations, the like people use it for like a tax write off. So like they don't need the money. They don't they don't even give a damn about like the cause, right? They just don't need the money, and they're like, oh yeah, I don't need the money, so like not to get my taxes like less, or now I have to pay less now. So that's a very big problem too. Yep, so true. So again, in a capitalist society, right? Money and power, those are, they operate synonymously. So, in other words, is this notion of going to do it on your own so you have the power to make your own decisions. I know the majority of y'all are in this class because you're looking for some financial security through employment. Or maybe not this class, but you're in this schooling system for that purpose, right? Think about it. 
who pays y'all that check is going to determine how a good majority of your life goes. And they tell you silly shit like, oh, we're going to spend more time with us than your family. We're your family now. Kind of ask backwards crazy shit. But this is what they'll tell you. And, and you'll take it on because you got a new job. Like, oh, for sure. Nah. So what you have to, well, I don't say you have to. My suggestion as you think about going into the workforce is having a way to determine what you're not going to give up just because of this. All a job is, is an arrangement for you to do a task and then to pay you for that task. That don't mean they could talk to you crazy. That don't mean that they could keep you over the hours that you are supposed to be. But they think so because they think because they're paying you, they have the power to, to dictate. For y'all who have, don't have jobs or never had jobs before, you don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. For those who, you do, who do, you know what I mean. And, and, and I hope for those who will have jobs, you remember this conversation. Especially as you're going through school. Because they really think you, they could take advantage of you because you're a student. The one thing maybe to think about, entrepreneurship. Be your own boss. That way you have the power to dictate, right? What are you thinking? Thoughts, start back. What are you feeling? That works too. Uh, go ahead, Jay. I think that on the part, the last part you said about entrepreneurship, on um, like being your own person, being your own, and like the space that you create, that's like, work you know work career and that you do it by yourself i feel like with that statement too that a lot of people don't realize that like that sound it, it's very beneficial like to it especially and because me myself too like like i'm on entrepreneur for it but i'd say that like for some people how do i say this i feel like some people like some people take it differently for like, I don't know how to explain it. Cause I've had people tell me that like, I shouldn't do what I do because it's like too risky or it's too, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's not a big enough, like back to like, if I fall, then I can't pick myself back up. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? But a lot of people don't see like the whole aspect of it, like the sides and the type of angles that you come at it, that it's a more grander aspect than just like, if I, if it makes it or if it doesn't make, you know what I'm saying? It's yeah. kind of like, it's like a building block more than it's just like a leap. I guess that like the best way I can put it. Um, that that makes sense. And, and I think also, Jay, um, for the, the, we'll call the detractors, right? Like, oh, there's no security there. Um, yeah. Oftentimes those people are coming from this paradigm that like these jobs give you insurance, they give you 401ks, they give you, you know, retirement, things of that nature. To be real, man, like jobs ain't shaking down like that no more. Like the yeah. notion of having like a social security, that shit is obsolete. Furthermore, yeah. when you talk about security with jobs, they will fire you like that, right? So this old notion of security is not really the reality for our now. And that, that's something that I see that my, uh, my youngest brother and my parents kind of go back and forth with because he's in the tech industry. So he jumped job yeah. like every six months. Like, nah, fuck that. Boop, boop, boop. You know, whoever paying best, whoever got the best situation. But for my parents, yeah. it's like, how are you establishing job security? It's job security. Like, the reality of working for some one place for 30 years and retiring is getting slim to none. Yeah. So I think that's yeah. all informed in, 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 you know, their advice that they're giving you. Yeah, I think that's true, too. A lot of people, one of the biggest things, too, with like, I feel like with entrepreneurship that a lot of people kind of skip over is passion. Like, if you don't really have like a driven passion for like what you do, I kind of have like this whole thing. Like, if you're not willing to, I, I forgot someone said it, but if you're not willing to do the job for five years with no pay, then you don't really have like that straight passion for it. 
And I was just thinking like, like it makes sense in a way that like, cause a lot of people will see as like, oh, it's a quick way to grab cash. But I think you said this before too, but like the, the cash, like it'll come to you as it comes and like, it's not something that you just chase after. It's just something that kind of, like, it follows you a little bit once you have it all in line. Yeah. But shit, be careful of working for free. <laughs> don't do that. Like, <laughs> yeah, nah, nah. Hit that money, man. Like, you know, I'm just playing. I, I see. I get your yeah. point. I get your point. Because yeah. yeah. uh, what you're saying is if you're working towards your passion, it may require you moments where you're getting paid less than what you deserve, but you're not getting paid what you need. Right. Um, and, and I went through that myself. Like, shit, yeah. that's the reason why I work at three different schools. Right. Yeah. It, it allows me to live my purpose. So it's a trade-off that I'm okay with, but it doesn't mean in the long run, I'm not going to be where I need to be. So um, yeah. what I want to also kind of lead you into Wednesday's uh, material. We won't meet for class, but, to, but do watch the videos because I would like to discuss them. Um, this notion of self-reliance, right? This notion of, of do it for yourself. We'll be watching footage on Black Wall Street and the MOVE movement. And these are two pristine examples, the highest examples of doing it for yourself. This area called the Black Black Wall Street in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, they amassed so much wealth that they were considering trading with countries like France. Not like the state of Oklahoma, but this area called Black Wall Street, right? That's they had so much wealth they were considering doing economic exchange with a whole nother country, France. So when you talk about self reliance and self sufficiency, and and the power of black economics, these are one of the premier examples of that. And then the Move movement, um, that's more contemporary. It's in the 1980s. Um, these are a group of Africans in America who decided to. Um, live off of their own resources and try to de detach themselves um, from as much as possible from government support in this really um, capitalistic, archaic way of living. Um, so again, two examples of uh, Black self-reliance and Black self-sufficiency, but they both meet the same drastic fate. So um, keep this in mind as you're going into um, Wednesday's material. Again, we will not meet on Wednesday, though. Um, I I'll be out of town. Uh, we will meet again next Monday. Um, are there any questions, any comments, any concerns?